Are you ready to tap into the $200 billion cloud opportunity? Working with the leading providers like Microsoft, Amazon, and Google. Are you interested in learning how to leverage the power of marketplaces to effectively grow your business and reach new customers? Are you dealing with the economic headwinds we've all been seeing this last year? And would you like to hear from an expert, the CEO of a leading company, driving effective go-to-market strategies with the leading cloud providers, then you're in the right place. This is the Ultimate Guide to Partnering, the top partnership podcast. In this podcast, Vince Minzione, a proven partner sales executive, shares his mission to help leaders like you achieve your greatest results through successful partnering. And now your host, Vince Minzione. Welcome to or welcome back to the Ultimate Guide to Partnering. I'm Vince Menzione, your host. And today, I welcome John Yonke, the CEO of Tackle, a company that specializes in helping software-as-a-service companies accelerate their cloud go-to-market strategies. And he joins to share how you and your organization need to take advantage of this massive opportunity we're all seeing around marketplaces and hyperscaler co-selling. If you're ready to accelerate your success, then you'll enjoy listening to this insightful interview with this amazing leader. Thank you for joining the Ultimate Guide to Partnering. Today, I'm excited to announce Ultimate Partners' first live digital event, Winning the Ecosystem, taking place on July 20th, where I'll be joined by Microsoft and the leaders leading this movement to cloud go-to-market and ecosystem-led growth. This will be a companion event to the Microsoft Inspire Conference, where you will learn how to achieve your greatest results in 2024. Please follow the link in our show notes to sign up for this exciting event. Thank you for joining us. John, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Vince. Great to be here. I am so excited to finally welcome you as a guest on Ultimate Guide to Partnering. We've been trying to do this for quite some time. You're the CEO of Tackle a company that specializes in the SaaS and ISV space, accelerating cloud go-to-market strategies. So welcome. Thanks. Excited to chat. You know, we had the opportunity to finally meet in real life. And, you know, I know quite a few of your team. I've had your chief cloud officer, Sanjay, as one of my earlier guests. But for our listeners that may have missed that episode, can you tell us a little bit more about Tackle? So Tackle, we actually got started in 2016 and co-founder and CTO Dylan had the idea that the clouds would change the way that software was sold. And he was part of one of the cloud providers beta programs for Marketplace. This is hard. And in general, no one wants to build software to sell software. There's a, there's a repeatable product here. And, you know, we raised a seed round with that hypothesis and started to invest and, and found pretty early success helping make it a business decision to launch cloud go to market instead of a product and engineering challenge. And we were able to work with some really interesting ISVs who who saw the future as well and were investing ahead of the curve because back then it was not as clear what was happening with this movement as it maybe is today. New Relic was our very first customer. And I remember the conversation where they're like, if half of what you say is true, we're in because we've been struggling with this and we really think there's something great here for our business. And we were born on AWS, but our customers really, it was clear to them. They're like, hey, we want to meet our buyers where they want to buy. And that's across the hyperscalers. And this movement's happening across the hyperscalers. And we want a partner who can help us go on that journey. So that led to a phase of innovation to expanding cloud go-to-market across the hyperscalers. And then, you know, really marketplace was where we started, but that's kind of the last mile. It's like the execution of a transaction. And a lot of our customers would say, well, I really want to better understand how to align cloud go-to-market with my pipeline. How could we accomplish that? This co-sell thing is really interesting to us. And we think there's magic to unlock and co-sell, but the process is still very human centric. Like how could we take that platform style thinking all the way through. And that's where we expanded our capabilities to allow an ISV to analyze their pipeline to make decisions about which of their customers, whether they're new customers or renewal customers, 
could go on a cloud go to market journey. We make that process of partnering with the clouds from a co-sell standpoint really seamless. We make executing a marketplace a business problem, and we allow you to do that at super scale. And then the last thing we've seen happen, a lot of companies who maybe weren't ready for it come to the table and say, okay, like the proof is there. How can we do this for all of our products? So it's it's a really fascinating time in cloud go to market. Yeah, it, it is fascinating. In fact, I've been working with an organization that's just at that point right now. They're finally jumping in the water, so to speak, and they've been holding back. They've been resisting. And it's funny, I think back to 2016, like, marketplaces were really not a thing yet. Co-selling was at its early days. I was still at the Microsoft side of that equation and then moved over as a channel chief. And we were still struggling to get some organizations to understand the value of the whole co-selling methodology and why that was important and why you needed to invest resources in, in that. So it seems like you got to it early. And then we've been talking about these last Well, I'll call it the economic headwinds we've seen since COVID. We've seen most recently layoffs and what's happening in the SaaS economy. And then marketplaces, this whole notion around marketplaces being more of a thing. So you've coined this term, cloud go to market, but can you tell us what it is and perhaps for our listeners, what it isn't? Yeah, it's a good question. And it's funny. We're always trying to figure out how do we meet our customers where they are on their journey? Because go-to-market in general is really complicated and is only getting more complicated. And I think cloud go-to-market is becoming part of that story. But if you rewind a few years, the way people thought about go-to-market 10 years ago, it was maybe direct and channel. They had their two options for sales. And then you saw like marketing become a real integral part of go-to-market as people started to think about their top of funnel differently and how do I better instrument a sales and marketing system together. And then you layer in product-led growth and everybody was thinking about, well, how could I make it easier to land or get people into our product sooner so they could think about how to get value without ever actually having a formal relationship with us yet. And then you layer cloud into that as a way to complement all of those motions. So we're on this journey where we think cloud go-to-market will become a default part of everyone's sales tech stack. And there'll be all of these different tools available to companies as they're being born to think about how they scale their go-to-market systems. And I think we're seeing the shift where companies today are being born more cloud go-to-market native, where they're saying, hey, as I'm building As I'm building my go-to-market system, I want to be able to align where my buyers operate, which most likely is in the clouds. And I want to be able to capitalize on the budget that the cloud providers have in order to make it easier for someone to get started with us. And I think that's an interesting part of cloud go-to-market for new companies. But for all these other companies who have all these different layers of go-to-market, cloud's a complement to them. And it's a way to... Either give your sellers more way to win, give your sellers access to budget that didn't exist before, which in this current economic time is a really powerful thing. Give your buyers access to solutions they need faster in order to solve problems. Well, you bring up an interesting point as you went through that journey, this uh, both the buyer's journey and the SaaS or ISV vendor's journey. And one of the things that strikes me is you look at the hyperscalers, the three hyperscalers primarily here. And then you look at some of the ISV companies that are moving to SaaS, right? Not the born in the cloud. You talked about the born in the cloud ones. We talked about those, the cloud natives. But those organizations, true, the model where I've got a channel, I've established a business process around the channel. In fact, I talk about how the organizations align and how it needs to align differently today because generally the channel is like bolted onto the sales organization. It's not integrated. And what I think I hear you talking about, too, is this integration component. Like, how do we get as an organization more effective at co-selling, not only with our hyperscaler vendors, but with our channel, even within our own organization, driving the resources that are directly touching the customer with the alliance and partner-facing parts of those organizations. Do you agree there? Yeah, I, I think, especially in companies of that vintage who were maybe born in an era where the capabilities of go-to-market weren't 
as significant or robust. Aligning cloud as an option for them to sell in new and modern ways is where we see the benefit happening. And it's not just the go-to-market side. These companies are thinking like the nature of the way their buyers use their products is changing. Yeah. These products may have been on-prem at one point. They may not have been operating in a SaaS or a SaaS hybrid style. And so their products are going on a journey. How their customers run are going on a journey, which means go-to-market has to go on a journey with them. And I always think about this from uh, what's the macro level movement? That's underway. And, you know, there's this $755 billion of B2B software that gets sold. No. And some percentage of that is migrating to the clouds. And is that 1%? Is that 10%? Is that 50%? I think we're still in the early days. And, you know, Canalis talks about how by 2025, they think it'll be $45 billion of the throughput. You know, today we, we estimate it right around 15 billion. Those numbers are growing about a hundred percent year over year. But if you said 15 billion of 755, it works out to roughly 2% today. Yeah. And a lot of times when we talk to these more traditional organizations, they're in the earliest days and the first transaction, like changing the way you sell, it's just like an, any new channel. When you, when you turn a channel on, getting your first win is the hardest one. But that helps you build the pattern for repeatability. And, and a lot of those companies have seen they've either done their first win or they've had buyer demand in this new way. And they're like, how do we capture that? And then how do we go on a journey to what percentage of revenue makes sense to us? And then we do the state of the cloud marketplace research every year. And this is one of the questions we ask. We're like, for ISVs, what percentage of revenue do you think cloud go to market will make up in your organization this year? And the most common answer was 10% this year. And when we first saw the data, we're like, is that a lot? Like, how do I think about that? And when you boil it down, you're like a $10 million ARR company having a million dollar channel. It's probably their first meaningful channel, right? A hundred million dollar company having a $10 million channel. It's likely their fastest growing channel, a billion dollar company having a hundred million dollar channel. That's probably their largest channel in the world globally scalable, powered by one of the fastest growing budget line items in enterprise technology. So the, that story of where people are at in their journey and even what they think that destination wants to be. I love to have that conversation with more mature ISVs to be like, well, what does good look like to you? Is this the ability to capture a deal or a couple deals? That's one thing. If this is you want to get to 10% of revenue. I mean, it's literally a revenue transformation. I, I want to hone in on that Canalis study, the 2025 study, right? So four, 15 million, I think is the number you used. 15 billion today, 45 by 2025. Yeah. Our data actually said 50 by 2025, but we're in the ballpark. Okay. Like we're, we're both in the ballpark. It feels like a pr pretty aggressive number to, to achieve in two years. Do you think those stats are accurate? I mean, you said 50, they said 45. Do you feel confident about those stats? I do. I, and I actually think like this is where the current economic climate, uh, we could see acceleration. And I think there's the opportunity for acceleration for two distinct reasons. One, the durability of the cloud budget during this time of economic instability is really powerful, which I think will drive an acceleration for ISVs to think about selling via the clouds. And the second is the movement that's happening with channel and how there's been so much focus from all the cloud providers around this first wave of cloud go to market has proven the second wave is coming and the second wave really does think about how do you line an ISV and a channel partner together to be able to meet the buyer the way they need to be met with the appropriate combination of product and services in order to solve their business problem. Yeah. So I think channel is a turbocharger for this cloud go to market movement. So those are the two things that cause me to believe like this actually becomes a gravitational force around this and the bigger it gets, the more it could accelerate. Yeah. yeah. I think you're right on with that, by the way. And I've been in the room with the channel partners and the ISVs having these conversations and really the blockers right now have been things like compensation for sales reps, compensation at the channel side, right? Top line revenue versus bottom line. And how do we make it whole for everybody? How do we make this achievable 
and a win-win-win across the organizations. I, I come back to this a, a little bit here because it feels like the momentum around marketplaces, we could all feel it right now, right? We were in the room a couple of weeks ago with a, with a, a host of ISVs and one of the hyperscalers, seeing it across what some of the other hyperscalers are doing. Microsoft has their big event coming up soon here. I'm certain there's going to be some announcements where Marketplace will take center stage. So where are we in the life cycle? I think about Jeffrey Moore's Crossing the Chasm, like one of my favorites, uh, probably one of the classic books on technology adoption life cycle. Have we crossed? Are we crossing? Like, are we mainstream yet? And where are we in terms of getting those later adopters and laggards on board? What do you think about that, John? Yeah, I, I think we've crossed the chasm. Mm -hmm. And I think we're in like using Jeffrey Moore's actual, I think we're in that early majority phase where you see the upslope of the curve, which ties to the growth rates that we're talking about. And the thing that changes from the early adopters are the pioneers, the visionaries. They see things before there's real proof and they're willing to make a bet. And that was the people who embarked on this journey back in 2018, 2019, 2020. Today, the proof is there. There's so much proof where the mainstream is saying, okay, there's clearly something here. Is this 50% of my revenue? Like some of these Borg cloud go-to-market native companies? Maybe not, but it's definitely not zero. When you talk to some of those companies and you have that percentage of revenue conversation, they're not talking about $10 million or $100 million. A percent of revenue is hundreds of millions or billions of dollars, which I think is further fuel to those projections. Because I had this conversation with someone recently where they're like, well, is the cloud, who owns the cloud budget and how, why would that work? Like, why would that make sense? Isn't this owned by like IT or the engineers or you're like, no, actually cloud has gone on this journey where in 2018, the cloud budget was probably a departmental budget line item. It was owned either by like infrastructure or application engineering or development or product or whatever you would call that group inside your company. And then as it got bigger, it started to move to be a CFO owned budget line item where you know, these oftentimes, especially as people are getting out of data centers and rebuilding platforms and products to run in the cloud, the cloud becomes one of their top five budget line items. And that's when the CFO and procurement's engaged and thinking about how do I optimize? Like, so even that shifting of the ownership of budget inside the buyer, I think is another factor outside of that large company transformation. I would agree there. On the CFO side, it's certainly a large line item, large budget line item. And I've seen firsthand the CFO negotiating directly with the hyperscaler leadership team on those numbers. The whole notion of the durable cloud budgets, I feel like you brought that really to light. I don't think a couple of years ago, maybe it was because of your focus and the research of your study, it really helped bring that, crystallize that for a lot of these organizations that are, they're on that journey. What about the ones that aren't there yet? Like, what would you say to them now? Like, how would you get them on board with driving this? Obviously, the ones that are resisting the most, whether it be channel strategy, whether it just be laggard mentality, mindset within the organization. What do you say to those organizations? Yeah, I actually, this is an area where thinking about just tackle and the journey we've gone on as a company, we're a SaaS company. We've built a platform and that's the way we thought about the world. How could we help people use our platform in order to go on this journey? But as we've shifted in the technology adoption lifecycle curve to this more mature company approach, we've actually had to evolve our approach because companies like that, they don't want to start with product. They actually want to start with strategy and that strategy oftentimes looks at the executive team where there's some education about what's happening in the market. There's some storytelling about customers who've had success and what powered that success. And then there's execution, like how can they get started? Because in, in these larger organizations, off, oftentimes it's not a single product discussion. It's a portfolio of products. And they often have a huge range of buying centers. And I think the best way to start is to focus, like choose the spot that makes the most sense to initiate this journey. And you don't have to go all in. You have, don't have to say day one, I'm going to get the 10% of revenue. You could say that's, that's part of the possible, but how do we go do a real experiment and see how this fits into the system? And I think 
one of the things we've seen over the last three years with large companies is oftentimes they get ground up in their own like internal discussion. Like how is, if I launch a cloud go-to-market strategy, how is my existing channel going to think exactly? About this? Well, that's an at scale problem. Like we can self-contain that to a spot where this is an experiment. Our buyers want us to meet them where they want to buy. This is a proven place. We have to experiment and understand how it fits in. And we're not changing our whole business strategy. We're doing a go-to-market experiment. And so back to how do we advise people who are stuck at that spot? Yeah. We oftentimes will reverse the order and say, let's start with the executive team and let's actually go through that education and enablement process to define what the right strategy is. Yeah. Because if you go too big, too fast, you're probably going to spend too much money and too much time and not actually have success. And what you really want is the tailwind of revenue and deal acceleration to drive your transformation, not some big picture press release and launch that doesn't actually turn into value for your buyers and sellers. I'm glad you brought up the C-suite or the executive team, because I always talk about this lack of a partner-led mindset in a lot of these organizations, right? Some of these companies, SaaS in particular, just a few years ago, the CROs primarily came from a direct selling motion. You didn't need a channel to sell SaaS. And then you've got this, I called it the appendage of the channel that's bolted on to the organization. It might be under the CRO. It might be in a different pocket. Generally, it's buried someplace and it's owned by a, a channel chief. And some of these channel chiefs have been around for 30 years. They came from the old I call it the Boca Raton model, right? When IBM yeah. launched a PC and the channel got created. That whole yeah. movement there. And then you've got the CFO sitting in the middle saying, why am I spending more money on an alliance strategy? I'm giving up revenue here on partners, on channels. Oh, I've got to pay marketplace fees. How do you think through? Is there a pat answer you have on how you get the alignment at the C-suite? Yeah, it's, a gr it's such a great question. And we haven't seen like the silver bullet answer here. It ends up being who inside the organization sees the vision and how to help them go on a journey to bring alignment across the stakeholders. Yes. And I've had a few conversations with ISVs lately that highlight uh, this. I, I was talking to a head of channel, medium-sized ISV earlier this week, and they're like, hey, in this economic downturn, if we can't tie our impact directly to top of funnel and revenue, People are going to ask questions about why we're here. Right. Like this is the era of productivity. And I think being able to think about it, not just from a strategic, what's our strategy from a partner standpoint, but it's strategy and execution, which brings that partner leader in the alliance and the revenue leader directly together. So I think those are traditionally the two spots we've started. If we're talking about launching cloud go to market, who in the revenue team is on your side to bring this to life? What does good look like? And if you don't have that stakeholder day one, you need to figure out how to get that stakeholder to the table with you to launch and sell. Yeah. Okay. We're in the era of productivity. What value do I get out of the costs in our go-to-market system? Yeah. And where do we want to invest more? And where do we need to think about investing less? And there's complexity here with channel, like the cost of channel layered into the cost of selling. But I, we're seeing CFOs emerge in those conversations in ways that they weren't. I've seen this happen where CEOs have a strong desire to evolve their company towards cloud and they're disconnected from an execution standpoint. And they actually really want to be able to bring the team together to get to like, how do we go do something together? And we've seen that in some of the largest orgs in the world. So. It's mostly figuring out who has the vision and how to connect the dots to success and then use that success to help them drive that broader engagement. You know, you mentioned peeling back on that client acquisition cost. Like if you could get into the numbers that an organization is spending all up on their go-to-market and their client acquisition cost, and you could say, this is what it's like in the model today, and this is what it would look like in the future. I think you've got a brilliant analysis there. Yeah. Still, it's... it's Selling and maintaining your customers is the most expensive part of every software company and really has yet to be optimized. And we're not simplifying the problem. We're making the problem more complicated. So costs are going up in some ways. And I do believe deeply the order with which this happens will change company by company based upon their product strategy. But every company will have 
direct sales. Every company will have channels. Every company will have product led and every company will have cloud. And those four things will enter their go to market system at different times based upon age of the company, the type of product that they have and how they think about prioritizing. Good segue here. I got to listen in on your big event. You talked about five steps to successful cloud go to market during that session. Could you take our listeners through what those five elements were. Sure. I, I think when we think about cloud go to market, it starts with strategy. And really your strategy ties to a lot of this executive alignment conversation we've been having, but it's also about your product strategy with the clouds. It's about your go to market strategy with the clouds and then how you're aligning resources and resources are a combination of people and technology in order to set your destination. And I think about, I'm a product person. I grew up a go-to-market person, became a product person over time. And inside a product, you're constantly iterating, you're constantly experimenting, you're constantly seeking to learn from your users. And I think that's the era we're in, in go-to-market. We're in this rapid experimentation era, but you need a strategy. So the second part of that becomes, how do you power your strategy with data. Mm. And we think very much in like the outcome that matters to our customers is selling. They want to sell more. They want to sell faster. They want to sell more efficiently. In order to determine the opportunities to go on this journey, you have to start with data and be able to analyze your existing pipeline and your existing customers to make decision about who you can deliver more value to with cloud go market. Mm. The third part is around your pipeline for cloud, which really centers around taking the intelligence you get from analyzing your existing customers and existing pipeline, distilling that down to where they're focused, and then leveraging this magic of COSEL in order to start to accelerate that pipeline. So the third phase is all about connecting with COSEL in order to improve the quality of your cloud pipeline over time. The fourth phase is all around marketplace and really being able to take that pipeline and turn it into revenue in a fast and efficient way. And this is where you get to tap into the cloud budgets. You get to tap into all of the benefits that clouds are investing in order to bring this movement to life. And then the last piece is all around scale because doing one deal looks very different than doing 10, looks very different than doing 100, looks very different than doing 1,000. And this is a multi-year evolution. Your first deal will be the hardest deal. And they will only get easier from there, but they will create different pain as you go on that journey. We've helped customers go on that entire journey from single transaction to thousands of transactions. And those who take a long-term view are the ones who acknowledge that, okay, we know we're going to wrap more resources around this in the early days to learn, to build the patterns of the future. And then we're going to take those patterns and teach our organization how to change with success. So those are the five steps that we think about when you go on this journey. It's a lot of organizational change in there, creating the operational excellence as well to drive that new initiative and that new model for the organization that you've put a stake in the ground with the strategy. Yeah. And this is where four years ago, <laughs> There were a lot of unknowns. Today, honestly, there are success patterns at scale across ISVs of all shapes and sizes, from seed stage startups being born cloud go to market native to growth companies who are investing much more in their go to market and are trying to think about which investments to layer in when to at scale sellers who are selling 10 or tens of percentage points of revenue to the largest software companies in the world, mostly are doing this big revenue transformation. There are success patterns across an entire ecosystem. So that brings up a good point. So what do you see from the best of the best here in these success patterns? Starting with the end in mind, like this is a strategic layer to your go-to-market system. So I think people who win think about this in a long-term way and then work their way back to what are the steps we take to get to the destination that we want to be. If you are thinking about cloud go-to-market for one deal, that can be success. It's not going to be durable success. It's not going to become an integrated part of your go-to-market system. I think the other part, going back to that first point around the like building your strategy, 
the ISVs who go fastest have executive alignment, have product strategy alignment, have go-to-market alignment, and know that they're going to invest in both people and technology to bring this to life. You can't make this a side project. You can't, like, and I say that because so many people have done this as a side project that became their next career. So if you're starting today, you want someone who's going to own it and focus on it. You want a tiger team clearly identified who's going to go execute on transactions. I, th I think like that strategy part is a really key formula and don't try to do too much too fast. Oftentimes we encourage people to start with one hyperscaler, start with one product, start with one deal. And people are like, no, 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 we know this is going to work. We want to launch in all three at the exact same time with all of our products. And we're like, yeah. You can't, we just do not see that as the success pattern. This is an evolution. I spend a lot of time in the application transformation world, like moving applications from on-prem to cloud. And it all started with one, like what's the one we're going to go change. And I think this revenue transformation all starts with what's the one deal you're going to start with and then go on that trip. Yeah. I love what you had to say here. I, I was thinking about the ones that just do it as a side project or do it to check the box with the hyperscaler to say, yeah, we've got this marketplace solution and market now versus being all in and doing all the things you just discussed. I mean, as this is not the easy button. Like there is no magic button for revenue in a software company, especially at this time. If you're going to do it, you need to invest in bringing it to life. That's no different than any other channel partner relationship. And even if you think about it, if you hire a direct seller, and you don't invest in helping them be successful, odds are they're not going to be successful. We all have to acknowledge the fact that selling today is harder than it's ever been, and we need to lean in to make it successful. If you're going to take it from a, we'll just throw it, we'll just hang a shingle and hopefully someone calls us, odds are it's not. So let's talk about the hyperscalers for a moment here. We discussed them briefly earlier, but it seems to me that they're at different stages in their maturity models as well. Rest was first out of the gate, the most advanced. Microsoft will probably, this is just a hunch, is going to put big investments when they do their 2024 Microsoft Inspire. And we were both at the Google event a few weeks back, right, where they laid out their plans. What are you seeing from the big three? What is your observation or predictions for the coming months? This is working for all three of them. Sellers are selling, buyers are buying. And they're all at slightly different points in their evolution and they're focused on different things and they're all going to continue to innovate, which I think will continue to make the domain more complex. Yeah. And I think with that, the coming together of Marketplace and CoSell has been really fascinating to see over the last couple of years because I, I do think like how those who nail CoSell win and win at scale because it's one thing to enable someone to list and launch in your marketplace. It's another thing to be able to let them use your budget in order to make it easier for their buyer to get access to your technology. It's a whole nother thing to help them actually sell. Revenue is strategic to every software company, fast, efficient, productive, global which I think is another super interesting spot. Because you think about building a go-to-market team in a growth SaaS company, one of the hardest things to do is to go global. It's expensive. When you talk to people, a lot of times they're not successful or they take repeated iterations. It's very channel rich, a lot of channel history there, which increases complexity. Like how the clouds can help with global, I think is a really interesting spot. So I think we'll just see more. We're going to see a lot more innovation, both from a business model standpoint, as well as a co-sell plus marketplace standpoint. And a lot of times going back again, 2018, I remember having a conversation with a buyer who was talking about their enterprise agreement. And this is like the earliest days of this idea of drawdown. Yeah. They're like, could I actually sell more to my customer? If I could convince them to use marketplace as part of the overall agreement. And that was like the earliest indications of, yeah, people are starting to understand this ecosystem effect at a cloud seller level could help them increase their share of wallets 
as well as deliver a lot of value to their buyers. Like, hey, we have all these first party services, but we have all these third party services. Put them together in the way that gets you your business outcome as fast and efficiently as possible. Since then, there's been like waves of these enterprise agreements that have gone through where now it's much more common to see that CFO think about, okay, I got my cloud agreement. How do I complement those yeah. two together? Like that's becoming more real, but we're still really in that evolution because we talk about the durability of the cloud budget. Those agreements oftentimes are durable. They're multi-year in nature. That's right. And now we see that across all the hyperscalers. It's a much, much more common pattern. The cloud's investing more in helping the buyers understand how to do this, I think helps the whole seller go. Yeah. It talks to also the power of the hyperscalers to enter the C-suite of those organizations and have those more relevant conversations than a startup SaaS company would and having those durable yeah. budgets aligned. And yeah, as a cloud seller, you have a better reason than ever to talk to the CFO, not, maybe not only the CIO, the head of infrastructure, the head of product, but the, the CFO, the CEO, and now even the CRO. That's a spot. How many salespeople actually got the attention of a CRO in a software company? Has? That's right. Not very many. So I'd like to pivot here, John. We talked a little bit about your career journey, but was there like a pivot or a spark that got you to become the CEO of this amazing organization? Yeah, it's a fun story. So uh, maybe going way back, because there's first the, when do you decide you want to do this point? In your career. Yeah. And I remember I worked for EMC. I started my career as an SE. Actually, I was a customer prior to being an SE. Joe Tucci was our CEO. And I'm an SE in Buffalo, New York. Like, And Joe's doing some big all-company meeting. And he talked about how he started his career as an SE and then went on this journey to be a product leader and then went on this journey to be a revenue leader and then ultimately a CEO. Now, I was 23 at the time. And I'm like, you know, that sounds pretty awesome. Like, I think I could do that. So there's this like distinct point where you're like, because people always ask me, when did you decide you wanted to do that? And I remember that point as a point in time where I'm like, that sounds like a really interesting journey. And then you get to the, how do you come together around an idea? And that really starts with people. So I, I was at EMC, we acquired this company, Greenplum. I joined Greenplum to help them scale. I was in like field, ran pre-sales and professional services. I'm always a field person, always in emerging tech. And a couple of people from Greenplum ended up on my team, Brian Denker and Dylan Woods, my co-founders. And they were super smart, super curious, like fun to be with. We did a lot of work together and they, like many startup people, didn't want to go on this big company journey. And they ended up going off and doing a couple other things. And we always stayed in touch. And those relationships... We had this synergy where when Dylan had the original idea, he came back and we came back together and we talked about it. So there was that like, I love the line from Hamilton where they're like, you never know who will tell your story. You never know who you meet, who will become part of your story. And that's been so true on the startup journey. So many people have helped us along the way and reached out and introduced us to a customer, reached out and introduced us to an investor. And sometimes people you don't talk to for years and you're like, wow, that's I mean. You just never know. So be a good human. Always try to maintain and develop yeah. those relationships because who knows where they go. So that was the second part, like us coming together. And then I originally was an investor in Tackle. And I said to Dylan and Brian, I'm like, I love what you're doing. I love the space. I want to stay involved. I've never done a day zero company. The smallest company I ever worked for was 140 people. And they're like, yeah, man, we'd love that. That'd be great. And Brian tells a story about how a lot of people say that when you're starting a company and how few people actually show up. Uh, and we just started doing the work together and it became really natural and got to the point where I was going to start a different company. And Brian's like, we've gotten to product market fit. You've been here since day one. Why don't you just join us full time and help us scale? And again, we kind of just grew together. It was startups are very much about timing. There's a lot of great people out there, but getting the timing right, like getting alignment and then the timing right is really tricky. And having grown up an SE, thinking about and being an SE in the year 2000, like dot-com mania, I wasn't in sales, but I was just observing the crazy behaviors. I'm like, this is really bananas. And being able to play a part in changing the way that software is sold, which is ultimately what I think we're doing. And that was the thing. Our early customers, 
they weren't saying that, but that was the signal we were seeing and feeling. That's the thing that even we didn't fully understand it in those early days. And it's just come to light in different ways over the years. And I think there was so much, we're in the earliest days of this revenue transformation. We're in the earliest days of this cloud go to market movement. So it's a bit of a longer, like there's a lot of twists and turns along the way, but that's maybe like yeah. a an arc of what that journey looked like. It strikes me as we think about beginning with the end in mind, being that marketplace offer, which I like to refer to as a non-fungible token, really becomes the objectification of bringing all those elements together in changing and shifting this movement, if you will, sh shifting this go-to-market motion across internally within the organization and then across your ecosystem. Yeah. So this is a fun question I like to ask just about every guest, John. I know you know about this question because we've had Sanjay on and Aaron on the podcast, but you are hosting a dinner party and you can invite any three guests from the present or the past to this amazing party. You could even decide where you want to have this great party. Whom would you invite and why? It's funny when you ask this question, uh, I, I thought about it a lot and I, I actually have two answers and there's two distinct answers. And one, I live in Buffalo, New York, which is where I was born and raised. My whole family is around me and my wife's whole family is around us I here. See. Like, and that's like what we live for. And so my first answer would be my mother, my grandmother, and my father-in-law who've all passed on and being able to come together one more time would mean the world to me. So that that's like answer number one, the more business relevant answer, I think, you know, it's probably, so uh, two of these are very famous people and one is probably less known. So the first one's Warren Buffett. I just think like yeah. such a fat, like such a fascinating story in so many ways, so much wisdom, so humble. And then one of his best friends is Bill Gates, who I also think like the learning arc on Bill Gates from the journey at Microsoft to being a philanthropist and everything he's done. So that's probably part two. And part three is someone named Robert Cialdini, who's a professor at Harvard, and he wrote a book about influence, which I read when I was in grad school. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. it's one of the things that I think most about just on this career journey of just trying to understand people and understand how they think and why his research really connected with me when I was in grad school. And he's someone that I've always wanted to meet. So those are three. Very cool. Two sets of three. I think we could bring them all together, you know, just have them all at the same. Where are we going to host this dinner party, John? Well, it's funny because I actually talked to my wife about this and I'm like, because originally I was like my mom, Warren Buffett. Uh, and I'm like, my mom wouldn't want to go that dinner. She'd be like, no, I actually want to spend time with you and like maybe bring your sisters. Okay. Like that would, that would be. Um, we can host a week then, uh, maybe. Yeah. She'd be like, ah, I don't care about those other guys. <laughs> like, uh, so where would we host it? I mean. Honestly, at home, in our backyard, at a table, like good people, good food, good times. I'm a pretty simple, pretty simple. Pr I love fine things, but at the end of the day, I'd, I'd rather a barbecue on good yeah. company over fancy food. Well, and we're talking about the weather getting nice now. So if you don't mind, maybe I'll bring a beverage and come along. I, I've only met yeah. one of those people, Bill Gates, and certainly only got to work with him for a short period of time. But I love yeah. Warren Buffett, so relevant at his age. And do you know the book by Cellini? What is that title on him? It, it's been republished. It's uh, uh, Principles of Influence, it's but there's a lot he, There's a lot of different versions around it. And there's just like seven principles of influence and understanding like how it really comes down to just like the way people react. And you see these principles in use and especially like all forms of marketing, like scarcity is a principle of influence. So Taylor Swift tickets right now. Yeah are the greatest example of scarcity applied. And she's not really benefiting from that, but the system is benefiting from it. People do unusual things for things they perceive to be scarce, right. like understanding that changes the way you think about things. It's that th those are the liking principle is another one. Like people want to work with people they like, yeah. like in general. And it's funny, you see it all the time. If someone shows up in a way where they're like, I don't know if I want to be around that person. That person doesn't give me energy. Yeah. Like, so it's, it's a fascinating read. Um, we're going to put a link to it in the show notes. I appreciate it. Okay. So any yeah. 
last words, calls to action, if you will, for our listeners, many of which are in the ISV community, the independent software vendor community, SaaS community, about optimizing their success and perhaps engaging with you and your organization? I think like Tackle, we've evolved a lot as a company and we continue to evolve on behalf of our 600 ISVs we support with and that number is growing every day. And I love when it was like almost a, we call it a boomerang, like someone we worked with at one point in time on our journey comes back around because they're like, hey, we actually, yeah, we worked together for a little bit, but now with everything you're doing, we want to work together again. And I think we've invested a lot in this idea of services and strategy and being able to meet customers wherever they are on their journey and even just to be able to share some expert advice. So that's a common thing. Like everybody knows they want to do more and people aren't exactly sure how and what the best practices are. And that's a thing that in this next era, the evolution of tackle or continued growth, we want to be able to share those stories more. Uh, and those, we try to like cloud, go to market XP. We try to bring the voice of our customers forward because it's their success that matters. Right. Like, but how we help people build their strategy for success. And I'd say we're here, we're here to help. Like we, we live to help sell or sell. Like it's the most fun thing I've gotten a P I, I feel like I've gotten a PhD in the software industry go to market over the last seven years. And that's been the greatest part of this tackle journey. So we're here to help. And I'd say, even if that's just engaging and sharing what's happening in the industry. Well, thank you so much, John. I was excited to have you as a guest today. I want to thank you for your time. Know how precious it is a CEO of a fast moving organization, a rocket ship, if you will, in this space. So thank you for your time. 